Okay, welcome to our next lecture, A World Ready for Change, Early Abstraction in Russia. So as the name implies, this is the first time that we're going to be seeing truly abstract art where it's not going to be related to any object in the real world. So the first artist we'll talk about is Kazimir Malevich. And according to Arneson, he took cubist geometry to its most radical conclusion. So if you remember when we talked about cubism, um, Brock and Picasso stopped short of going all the way to fully abstract art. In other words, non-objective art. They always had something that they were actually making pictures of. But we're going to see that Malevich is eventually, actually rather quickly, going to take this style and, as Arneson says, um, to its most radical conclusion. So Malevich studied art in Moscow, and this was pre-Revolution Moscow. The revolution will be important. And he studied some styles like Neo-Impressionism and Cubism. But unlike most of the other artists we looked at, he never tra traveled to Paris. He called his style uh, Cubo-Futurism. Um, and you can kind of see how it could be considered in that way. We have some of the movement, like we'll see in the Futurist movement a little bit later on. I'm doing things slightly out of order here. Um, but you can see the facets and being able to see things from many points of view, like we had seen in the Cubist artist. Uh, so, for instance, look at this house. You'll notice that you have some lines that lead to uh, a disappearing point in the background. And that's from one point of view. And then the same house, we see different disappearing points. And then when we look at the road in the background, again, different dis disappearing points. So it's almost like we're seeing this particular set of houses as, as if they're moving or as if we're moving relative to them. Which is kind of ironic because you see the people who are moving, but we're seeing them from basically one point of view. I think you, another thing you can see too is this idea that Malevich took pretty seriously that Cezanne had. The idea that you start as a student. You try to make the simplest shapes, the cylinder, the cone. And we're seeing Malevich doing that here, especially with the figures. So he developed a style and eventually he reached a point where he thought, what are we doing? Um, there's an end to this. There's somewhere we should be going. Uh, in my desperate attempt to free art from the burden of the object, I took refuge in the square form. Uh, so he had the black square, which we see here in this particular exhibit, the room for the last futurist ex exhibition. It was called the last futurist exhibition. Uh, so they knew they were moving on. More on that in a minute. Um, so the black square, square hung in a corner like a Russian icon. So in Russia, if you're not aware, uh, they follow Orthodox Christianity, which is almost identical with Catholicism, uh, but they just had more of a political than spiritual sp split in about 1000 AD. And people that are in what used to be the Byzantine Empire usually follow this religion. And in Russia and in some other Orthodox countries like today's Greece, uh, people would tend to collect icons. They would be saints or pictures of Jesus and Mary, uh, often in a very medieval style. And the idea is these saints would bring you good luck or safety or other things that you might need. Um, so by putting it right across from the entrance to the house, it was it could kind of fulfill the spiritual purpose. So he puts the most simple of his shapes, the black square, just like the Russian icon, kind of showing that this is more than just simplifying shapes. This is a kind of spiritual re revolution. So he called his style of art suprematism, the supremacy of pure feeling in creative art. Uh, so his idea was that you could universalize art by trying to figure out what could speak to the most international of audiences. So as soon as you start having images, even if it's people 
uh, you're going to have things that are relative to a culture as far as how they're being understood. So we wanted to kind of rise above that or, or kind of move wider than that to try to have things that people would be able to react to instantly, regardless of their culture, even if they were living um, as hunter-gatherers on the other side of the world, that they would be able to see this and still get something from it. So as Arneson says, a new beginning corresponded to social transformation leading up to the Russian Revolution. So Malevich, like a lot of the artists we've studied so far, including Picasso, um, was a socialist. And he was definitely part of the movement of what you would call utopian socialists. Uh, I'll put a link to an interesting book um, that kind of is the masterwork, I guess, of utopian socialism called Red Star by Bogdanov. And the idea was, is that we could get to a world where everybody's needs were taken care of, everyone could contribute to society as they're able, uh, and through this, people could have freedom, um, and not just freedom to do whatever they wanted, but also freedom to be able to contribute to the betterment of humanity. Um, so the idea was, is that capitalism, because it's driven by the desire for profit, and pretty much nothing else, that it can produce lots of things, uh, but it doesn't necessarily produce things that are better for humans. Um, that certainly turned out to be the case. Uh, so the idea with these types of socialists was when you're looking at taking out material items, um, they're not talking about they're anti-materialists. They're materialists, in fact. They just think that materials could be better for humanity and not just be related to exploitation like you would see in a system of capitalism. So he looked at suprematism and the way he used color as having stages. Um, it would be through black, which is kind of something where it's not quite there or it's written as now, uh, and then red, uh, that's the color. That's a transitional color. He may be referencing, too, that in revolution, sometimes there's violence. Uh, and then there's white. Everything is open. There could be a bunch of possibilities. Um, so you could think of this, like sometimes when we think of black and white, you can think of it in a white supremacist way, and it's not really that way. More, he's thinking of black are the things that have already been written, the systems that we see around us. And white is the possibilities that we don't even know yet. Um, so a complete renunciation of materiality. Uh, but again, that isn't to say that you can live life without material things. Uh, what the these um, types of artists uh, and these types of political thinkers wanted to do was make a material world that was bountiful for everyone, where everyone could do work to be able to contribute to society. So white symbolized the real concept of infinity um, and the infinite possibilities of the future. So when the Russian Revolution did happen, um, it wasn't necessarily by the utopian socialists. <laughs> um, it was by the Bolsheviks, although um, all types of socialists were involved in the revolution. Um, the early people that were in charge of kind of funding art in the revolution were really interested in these radical artists because it expressed some ideas they th thought fit pretty well with their ideas of Marxism and socialism. So this style had effect on many artists. Um, this kind of next step, too, in making completely non-objective works would also have an influence. So clarity, certainty, and order distill in the Netherlands. And I'm specifically going to talk about the artist Piet Mondrian. So Mondrian, like we saw with Milevich, started off with earlier styles, but ones that were already looking quite different from the people he's influenced by. So in this apple tree, the pointless version, you might think of the Fovis, or you might think back to Seurat that we talked about earlier. Uh, but he did these in a series, uh, kind of like Degas did, 
um, where we would place many different paintings on the wall in different colors of the same subject with this very gestural type of painting, like we saw with the Fovis and like we saw with Van Gogh. So he was trained in Amsterdam Act Academy as a landscape painter. So you can kind of see how he's working towards the trees, kind of like what we saw with Monet. Um, and he always worked in a series and wanted to have these series displayed together. Obviously, a Fove influence and all of the other influences I talked about as well. So in 1912, he moved to Paris and was exposed to Cubism. And kind of like Malevich, he realized it didn't go far enough. Uh, so moving beyond the tenets of Cubism to eliminate both subject and three-dimensional illusionistic depth. So you may remember that even when we looked at the strangest Cubist works from this time period, uh, we're still having real things and almost real landscapes in a way. Uh, so he started out by having central compositions. And at this period, even though it looks very geometric, geometric he is actually inspired by real things. This was based on Parisian building facades. So if you ever go to Paris, big parts of it are very organized. Um, going back to the 17th century, they kind of reorganized Paris from the medieval city, which was pretty messy, uh, to something that fit the Renaissance ideals of the time. And they kind of continued through to the 19th and 20th centuries. So Cubism did not accept the logical consequences of its own discoveries. It was not developing abstraction toward its ultimate goal, the expression of pure reality. I felt this could only be established by pure plastics, plasticism. So when he says plastics, he's not talking about the things that you put your food in and then seal it in the refrigerator. Uh, instead, he's talking about things that can move, that can be molded, that could be different shapes. Something that's plastic is something that can be made into many different things, uh, an almost infinite number of things, which is why they got the name and use that for uh, the material of plastic. So it, as he went along, he decided, I don't need an inspiration of things. I can think of it, like we talked about with Whistler way in the beginning of the class, almost like music. Um, when we have colors, we have lines, we have shapes, they can appeal to people, like Malevich was thinking, in a universal way. So if you think if you listen to music, especially like instrumental music, like classical music, or think of dance music like house or techno, these musics are popular all over the world and can be understood even if people don't live in the culture. Um, they kind of speak to people, uh, especially when without the lyrics, in a way that may be hard to describe, uh, but can really stir your soul. Um, so on plastic art, remember, and this is talking about things that could be shaped in the many things, plastic art, reality can be expressed only through the equilibrium of dynamic movements of form and color. So kind of like music, um, he's using dynamism. So composition and color A, just like you would name a musical movement. Pure means afford the most effective ways of attaining this. So like some of the artists we looked at previously, Seurat, for instance, Mondrian was really interested in scientific color theory. And through his research, he had figured out that some colors are seem to be universal. Like there have been studies with children um, and with people around the world and found that colors like red, black, blue, and yellow um, spoke to people in a way that seem to be universal. I'm not saying this is true because it may not be. Um, it probably isn't. But we'll kind of see. Perhaps he was right. Um, so a balance of unequal opposites. Simplification of color to the primary hues plus black and white. So he returned to Holland from Paris in 1914. And to him, he was still doing a subject here. Um, even though he had this kind of musical composition thing going on. And then we get to something that you've seen before, and not just because we did an in-class or we did a discussion online about it, um, but even before that, I'm sure that you had seen something like this before. And once you have seen it, you've recognized it. 
you probably think, hmm, I could do that with some tape and more on that later and some paint. True, but it is something that speaks to people because once somebody has seen one of these pieces, um, they know it forever. So he lived in Paris from 1919 until 1938. Uh, that year is pretty relevant. That's when the Nazis were becoming a danger to Europe in 1938. Uh, and he called this new style with these compositions neoplasticism, the new form or new image. Uh, so you can see this one's called Composition with a Large Red Face, uh, Yellow, Black, Gray, and Blue. And that's what he called all of these pieces, um, just by their colors and sometimes by their shapes. So he was interested in a subject that's actually really relevant to here in Detroit, and that is theosophy. So theosophy was this kind of spiritual idea that was developing in the West and in other places that all of the religions of the world are looking for something. They're looking for perhaps like a spiritual absolute, as in like a kind of release from everything uh, and being one with everything, kind of like nirvana you would see in Buddhism, um, or searching for some kind of spiritual resonance. So the theosophists thought it would be a good idea to study all the religions around the world and try to get people together and find what the best practices were to try to understand these things uh, and hopefully spiritually uplift people in this way. So they're really about universals. Um, so again, the strengths and weaknesses of universals, perhaps that's another discussion, uh, but that was their idea. And theosophy, um, a theos theosophic society was really popular in the Detroit area, and they still have an office on Woodward Avenue um, talking about these things. You can visit them and you can learn about hundreds of different religions around the world. So for Mondrian, trying to speak in this almost scientific way with the primary colors that supposedly would speak to everyone and shapes, he could universalize um, in the same way that the theosophists were hoping to do. Um, so pure plastic expression, inward that humans could approach the divine, the universal, basically the same goal as the theosophists. So he eliminated the foreground, the background, and it's just flat. It's just sitting right up on the canvas. Um, and he attached spiritual meaning, like we saw with Malevich, to different colors. So red is more real. White is more spiritual. Again, kind of emptiness or openness um, and attach those types of colors, those types of ideas to various colors. So like I said, you might think this is all kind of wild and kind of silly in a way uh, because of the, w the simplicity of it. But if you've already done the discussion in class or if you're in a future class that hasn't done it yet, um, you probably realize already the power of this combination of images, especially this combination of colors. Um, so if you look around and try to find, especially uh, things that were designed through the 50s to the 70s, you'll find the advertisers figured out right at the time when they were trying to spread their businesses internationally, um, that red blue, black, and yellow, and white, that these were the colors they would use and they would communicate and be memorable to people. So if you look, all of the big international companies that were designing these logos uh, post-World War II, uh, so not that long after Mondrian was making these pieces, uh, you'll notice that all their logos follow these kinds of colors. So instead of trying to spiritually uplift people, trying to sell people soda or fast food or whatever. Um, probably not as nice of a thing as what Mondrian was trying to do. So in 1938, he moved to NYC. Uh, it was clear that Nazi Germany uh, was dangerous uh, to people and artists. Uh, so many people moved to America, uh, which was thought to be safe. 
And he tried to simplify the way he was doing work uh, with this particular one, which has a kind of a cute name, Broadway Boogie Woogie. He worked with masking tape that could be moved about the canvas. And that way he could create something almost like the way that musicians, when they write music or musicians that are producers and create beats, you kind of like move things around and try to figure out where they would go best. Um, same idea with this sort of thing. So the truly modern artist sees the metropolis as abstract life given form. It is closer to him than nature and will more easily stir aesthetic emotions in him. So Mondrian was looking around New York and he was seeing all of these new things, this incredible new architecture, all of this new technology, uh, the movement, the energy. And he thought of it, this is something new to humanity. Like this isn't something you would be able to see in the past. Um, and you can kind of imagine someone who hadn't been to um, like Times Square in New York before. And then even if they're from, we're living in Paris before, uh, they look at this and they see all of the lights and the movement. You can almost see how that's coming out of the page. Um, hence the Broadway boogie woogie referencing a particular type of dance music that was popular at the time and the way that when you went to New York at that time and sometimes today too, uh, you see all this movement, all these people, it's almost like a giant dance with all these interlocking parts. So this one, um, I'm going to be doing one or the other uh, in a online or in-class discussion. Um, so if you're in the current class, you've already seen it. Uh, but that's all for this particular lecture.